Hello and welcome to Contractor Success Tips. Today's guest is Garrett Seiler of Seiler Construction. All right. Well, welcome everyone to another edition of our Contractor Success Tip podcast. I'm your host, Ed Earl, the Zen Builder. And today we're excited to have with us Garrett Seiler from Seiler Construction. And Garrett has a very interesting uh, story of the developing of his, his company and that he took over from his dad. And so we want to hear about that. And then uh, we're going to have a couple of discussion questions to go over with him as well. So Garrett, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. So Garrett, let's just jump right in. And why don't you share with us kind of the history of, of your company and your involvement and going back to with, starting with your dad. Yeah, so uh, my dad, um, which is Jerry Seiler, he's been in construction for, oh gosh, I'm aging him now, probably about 40 some years. Um, he started as a union carpenter, kind of traveled all around the Midwest uh, for some big uh, general contractors, and then uh, pretty much wanted to settle in as he started his family. Uh, my mother was his uh, partner um, as I was going through high school. Um, I went to college uh, at UCM, which is University of Central Missouri. They have a construction management degree there. So uh, they also had a design, uh, architect design program. So just allow you to kind of go learn the ins and outs of architectural, but not, you know, taking the, the next step, but then also trying to evolve that into a construction management degree. So whenever I got out of college, um, you know, it, during that time, it was kind of rough. Uh, the recession was starting to happen. Uh, so we, we basically just, uh, I went to go work for him as a project manager. He threw me out to the wolves right at the get go. Uh, we were doing a $6 million uh, car dealership. Um, and you know, a young buck, 23 years old out of college, you're proud of your degree. You're thinking you're just going to you know, go right up to a job site and just have all the success in the world, especially with your dad, you know, having your back. It was not like that at all. I had union guys basically say, I'm not taking orders from this young, young buck. Um, it was, it was definitely a learning experience. I learned more in the first three, four months of that project than I did four years of college. Um, but I was also more proud of what I learned of that too, because my dad allowed me to fall on my face and but was there to you know lend a hand to help me up, allow me to fail, but then not hurt the project, but then also just kind of guide me into a direction how to maneuver so, around. So I'm curious, how does someone allow you to fail without hurting the project? I think that's a very well. Uh, with that being said, some of the, uh, we do a lot of design build. So whenever right. you do design build, there's a lot of change orders that get involved in that, and. Whenever you're doing a big remodel, but also major additions, there's a lot of unknown. So it allows you to kind of be successful. Um, when you do make a mistake on it, you're allowed to, you know, call a timeout, get the architect to engineer to ball, kind of come up with a game plan to figure out how to maneuver around the situation. And then also pass, pass it along to the owner um, where it's an extra. Uh, but, you know, everyone learned from it. But then again, you just move forward. So, okay. um, so during that, uh, you know, at that time, cellular construction was more just commercial. Did a lot of office buildings, a lot of tinted finishes, a lot of metal buildings, car dealerships, and whatnot. Uh, and at that time, I had a lot of successful friends that were doing well for themselves, and they wanted to uh, wanted us to build a home. So I was like, "This is great! You no, know, I'm going to have all these these friends, the easy business. I don't have to chase work." So we started to uh, design um, these custom homes and build them. But at that time, I thought it was great. We'll just use all these commercial subs and bring them over to residential. Uh, as I learned really fast, it doesn't work like that. I mean, the, so, the cost so can, of... Yeah, can you explain why that doesn't work? Because I know some people have tried it. So why can't you take a residential frame, I mean, commercial frame or bring a residential job or a commercial plumber to residential? What doesn't work about that, Jared? Well, one, you, got, you, got, you have non-union and union and commercial. So when you're out there, uh, I'm a non-union general contractor. So, I mean, depending on what shop, depending if it's, uh, you know, like, for instance, Ford, you know, they're a union shop. So you're also going to get picket on a lot of the, the commercial side. So 
it allows your non-union scale to go up to be competitive, but also be underneath the union scale. Well, in residential, there's nothing like that at all. You have no overhead. Your subs have pretty much, uh, we are a mom and pop shop, but they're truly the mom and pop. They're out there right. in a pickup truck. They don't have an office, you know. I mean, their their overhead is in the back of their pickup truck, you know, and they're just chasing job job site to job site. So the the margins was so different where um, I was thankful to have build jobs, but I had to figure out a way really quick to to um, to to grow um, a sub base team uh, to be successful on the residential side. Uh, and for instance, that? go ahead. How did you do that from scratch? Uh, you know. <laughs> to try to find one that you liked and you know negotiate and then really have them believe in yourself to say hey i want to try to go by here and i'm going to do work uh, for instance same thing with architects uh um, it's kind of reverse strategy but um i, I build my team but uh, to build my team around me you got to believe in yourself so you know uh, so I just went out there and started, you know, building my team as, you know, got picked up a trim carpenter. Uh, then that trim carpenter, you know, started uh, not to be able to keep up. So he brought on another trim carpenter. And, you know, uh, through the past 10 years, it's been fun because I've actually helped grow small businesses into something that they never thought they could do. But mm -hmm. they also leaned on me to be able to uh, allow them to grow their business with my business. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the residential side, you know, one thing I did learn, um, and I don't know, you guys are in, in San Diego and Hawaii, but in the Midwest right now, it's hunting season. So, you know, you can't get a hold of any of your, your subs from seven o'clock to probably nine o'clock because they're in deer stands and right around two thirty, your, your, uh, voice, uh, you basically just get a voice message right, uh, right at that time. So. So it, it's just now commercial, uh, you have deadlines, you get penalties. I mean, you have to be able to hit deadlines and there's no excuses whatsoever. I mean, these guys are actually running in businesses. So they, they're turnkey. They're ready to make money off of their building that you're building them. Or in residential, uh, a lot of the owners are, you know, this is our, this is our pride and joy. This is our home. So they're okay. Sometimes it take a little bit longer to get the quality if they have to wait a little bit. So. Hopefully I explained that. Yeah, I got it. Cool. So, so go ahead. I think I, I, I think I cut myself off on that. So as I started growing the residential side of my business, um, I went ahead and really started picking uh, school districts. So, you know, in the Kansas City area, there's a lot of subdivisions and a lot of rural areas around Kansas City. Kansas City itself is really not that big, but there's a lot of pockets around Kansas City. Um, so uh, I just invested into certain subdivisions in the top five schools and really became an ally with the developers around that area. And now how then, did you do that? I mean, did you contact them and buy lots from them or how did you develop yeah. that? Yeah. So uh, when I first started, I didn't have a lot of specs, you know, it was more custom home. But the problem with my lockdown contract scheme was that owners, they have to see it. I mean, it's hard for them. You know, I'm from my commercial background. We have a drawing. It's all right there. You have a contract. You just keep moving forward. Owners, once they see something, they might not like it. So they want to change. So it's constantly uh, the, the your your deadlines are always getting stretched out quite quite some time, which you know, you have set overhead on that uh, that project. You're wanting to turn and burn so you can be even more profitable. Well, custom just kind of drags on a little bit. So once I start picking a couple build jobs and taking them to those areas of a subdivision, um, I started to, you know, take off a little bit more of, hey, I'll, I'll buy three lots. One of them is a build job. I'll put a model and I'll just sit on that lot for a while and, and, you know, if a build job comes along or another spec uh, I'm interested in building, I'll just uh, put it on that lot. Then over time, I started growing and um, with a good economy and low interest rates, you know, you got to have enough inventory out there. For instance, this past six months has been, it's been a blessing, but then again, it's been a curse because 
I literally had two phone calls on, you know, almost million dollar homes. I don't have inventory for them to see. But if you go to my website, hey, check out my my models. Here's my plans. Here's my virtual tours. It's help. But once again, if you're asking a client to get out of, you know, their checkbook and write a 600 to a million dollar, you know, loan or stuff like that, they're not really wanting to rely on a virtual tour. They want to physically walk that plan. Uh, see how it feels, you know, is there enough room for a makeup center or something for the wife or is a garage big enough for uh, the husband's tools and boat and stuff like that. So, um, so the, uh, so like I said, the, the developers, there's a lot of developers in the Kansas City area uh, through the past five years uh, became good allies with it. And we started a development phase in our, in our own uh, cellular construction. So um, we, we developed, probably 100 and 100 to 120 acres uh, have different phases, maintenance provided villas, uh, whatnot. Mm-hmm. But then by creating a good ally and good team, you're bringing other builders that you build with and it, uh, side by side with into your own community. So, right. you know, you're scratching each other's backs. I'm buying from a, um, a developer slash builder in his community where he's double dipping. But then again, I, if I'm capable of starting a development company and, and developing this part of land, I'm bringing him over. So right. it's kind of so what what, perc- what percentage of your work is you're just spec built or you know you versus custom homes at this point? Or commercial? Uh, right now, I'm probably 2020. I I'm probably 70 percent spec to 30 percent build job. Or before right. it was it was flipped, but. If you create a good system and you have a good team around you, um, you're able to build specs faster. I mean, and the, and the areas that I'm building are on the outskirts of Kansas City. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of people, a lot of uh, corporations that are transferring key people into the area where they don't have time to build. I mean, they, 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 want, a, they want a nice home. They want to get it to a certain phase of the house. And they just want to make their changes where it makes them feel good that, yeah, I, I built a custom home and in all essence, they only picked a couple tile samples and right. change paint colors and stuff like that. So, so do you, are you going to move eventually into all spec away from customs altogether or not? No, no. I'm at this point in time, I'm really trying to teeter totter around that 50, 50 because in a good economy, like right now, I mean, interest rates are low specs are great, but, there's going to be a slowdown. We all know it. I mean, it's a roller coaster ride. You do not want to be stuck with all these specs out here. So, you know, I just want to have enough specs. My goal is to have probably, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 specs and five to six communities, and then basically build off of that and really try to, you know, build as many custom homes or um, build jobs off my specs at the same quantity of yeah. my. Uh, and how do your gross margins change between specs versus custom? Is it about the same, like 15%, 20%, or does it change a lot? Uh, your custom jobs can jump up to about 20 um, on, on really big jobs because um, you're taking more gamble, uh, especially when you're going out there and building on anything from five acres to 20 acres, you know, utility, right. your gamble a lot. Uh, your specs, you know, I mean, depending on the community – I really try to strive on my competition. I mean, I really like to be in the middle, you know, or or maybe even a little bit lower and where, you know, I'm making really good margins. And again, I can't really comps either. Um, but yeah, right. I, I teeter from 12 to you know, 18% right. on the specs. But what I do is I, I create a base price of each community that I build in. And then what, the, what they have is a 40-page selection book that they sit down, and then I have built-in margins on top of that. It's also right. built in for a realtor, too, because at the end of the day, the realtor takes a cut of the final sell. So, right. And do you use realtors, or do you have your own salespeople? Uh, in my own community, I have my own sales team. Um, and then over, in four or five of the other communities, they have their own, their own uh, sales team. Well, can tell our audience how how you can, how, we got a couple of people that we out there that are doing mostly you know sort of like you, which is better and what's the advantage of using your own people versus a realtor because you'd know because you use both. Uh, you know I I have a couple 
my competition, there's only one or two that I, that I compete against that they have their own sales team. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not developed that as of yet. I have reviewed them and analyzed how they work. And I like it. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just basically going to have to carry more overhead and get uh, your own sales team underneath that where they have their license to sell for you. Um, mm -hmm. And I see it both ways. I mean, I, 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 I have a developer that is a builder that is uh, um, the realtor too. I mean, wow. is it good or bad? I mean, I, I don't, if you can manage it, yeah. But again, I don't know how you have that much time on your hands, to be honest right. with you. Okay. So you, you, you prefer one or the other? It depends on the circumstance. Uh, it's a, it's a circumstance, I would say. Like, like I, I have the same uh, Clemens Homes team that works in Kearney for me. I've w had them for five mm. years. They're great. I mean, you know, you, you learn their strengths and they know your strengths and any builder that I bring in my own community, I want to make sure I sit them down and say, Hey, we're really big into marketing. You want to push your product. I want to see your plans. You got to have an open mind, allow us to help each other because we all want to succeed. I mean, the faster right. I can get, I'm not just selling lots. I got to sell inventory. You know, I right. want them to make money so I can open up another phase where we all can make money. Right. So once once the builders can get their head around that, and you know how it is, it's a cutthroat market out there. Everyone doesn't mm -hmm. think that everyone's just out for themselves. And and if you just work as a team, and and you'll hear me say team a lot. I mean, I really am. You, you know, you build off of each other. I have a, a, a spec company that builds 80 to 100 specs a year, and they will not build build jobs. Anything outside of a community, they just don't do. So they they basically just give them my phone number vice versa. If they're in a tight budget and they want spec, I, I, I refer them to them. So you, you know, it's great. I mean, that's your network right there. So that's good. Well, that sounds cool. Um, I noticed that you have successfully taking the business over from your father. How'd you pull that off? <laughs> I would love to say it's easy, but uh, family businesses are uh, a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, I assume you still talk to your father, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, no, good. Okay, I, I don't want to be mistaken here, so good. I don't think I, I'm ever going to be able to get him to retire. I'm very, I'm very blessed in what he does, and um, you know, he growing up and watching him um, be successful, but then also getting in his own way a lot. You know, micromanaging, uh, not allowing people to grow outside, you know, his comfort level. Mm -hmm. It was basically, he was always just grind. He was never in the future. You know, he was always wearing multiple hats and I just, it could never allow him to grow. And then whenever I just got to a point, um, you know, I was, I was hungry. I was ready to evolve and, you know, I learned a lot from him, but I, I felt like I was getting held back a little bit. Um, we basically just came to a war room and just threw everything out on the table say, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. Instead of us, going out there and competing against each other why don't we just uh just sit down and kind of figure out the direction and, and roles of the company and, and move forward once once we got through the nuts and bolts of the contracts and stuff um you know he specialized on commercials so any of the commercial clients he built but the residential i built roughly three or four key managers underneath myself that uh they run the residential side, like so. It allows me to jump back and forth with the commercial and residential with my with my father. It's it's been it's been a blessing. Not saying it was easy. I mean, it was hard. I mean, there was a first couple of years you're bumping heads. I mean, he people still make fun of me to this day. They're like, "Why do you why do you call him Jerry when isn't that your dad?" I'm like, "Well, yeah, it is, but you also want to respect each other too, you know." Now, looking at your website, does anybody ever say it says Garrett Seiler, President, Garrett Seiler, Vice President, Gerald Seiler, Vice President? Obviously, you look like his boss. Did anybody have a hard time about that on the website? Because that is very unusual. Well, it all depends on who you ask. Because I look at my, when you ask my father, he, he'll he tell you, oh, yeah, you know, I let him buy me out, blah, blah, blah. I just gave him the, the title and stuff. 
Mike, last time when you give someone something, it's free and, uh, you know, you, you earn it and you pay for it. So um, we had to structure and over time, you, like I said, I, I was evolving the company as I am today. I'm still wanting to try to grow the company next five years, 40% each pop. And my dad's comfortable. I mean, he he's he he likes it. I mean, there's no really a lot of stress on him. He he enjoys what he does, and you know, um, there's not a day that goes by that we co- we start our mornings talking to each other. Hey, well, what are you tackling? Today? What what what's his role and what's your role in the company at this point? So right now, Jerry handles all the commercial. I handle more of the residential. Any sales, I I tell Jerry best. So he has a lot of uh, clientele from the commercial side that we still do business with. Um, he specializes in all the design build aspect of it. Um, on the residential side, if I figure, if I find a client and I pick a lot, that's when Jerry gets involved. He's really good at shooting grades, um, works with utilities. Uh, he knows the ins and outs of getting the, the project out of the ground. Where I'm more focusing on marketing, sales, um, finances, stuff like that. And Garrett, what do you do to get new clients? Obviously, you're doing what? You said 30 million, 20 million? I forgot the number. So how I get more clients is, one, subdivisions, school districts. You got to be in the pockets for the residential side. You got to get in good, good school districts. Once you get in that, you gotta. I do a lot of marketing. If you go to our website um, under custom homes, you can click under there, and there's homes for sale, and there's floor plans. I I try to help uh, all the realtors that are in all the subdivisions, um, or when people call me and inquire about any of my projects, I'm able to jump on it ASAP. And what I strive in, and my father's um, beat this into me at a young age, where you can call me anytime. I mean, you text me or call me. I always tell people, give me one hour. Um, now, it doesn't make my wife always the happiest person at times. Right. But I tell people, it's like, look, you can reach me, but it better be, you know, serious. Or, or you know, if it's an emergency, I'm, I'm there. You know, you can directly call me. It makes them feel comfortable. But if you're calling me because you can't get a hold of my, my managers and you're wanting to change a, a floor color or, or paint color, uh, you know, you get one pass and after that, you know, call me the next day. Mm-hmm. But marketing, definitely. I mean, you got to market. I mean, SEO, um, uh, packages. Uh, I mean, if you scroll down on the main page, you know, I have a residential and a commercial brochure. Um, Builders Trends helped me evolve the company a lot. It took me two years to actually get my team to feel comfortable using that software. But uh, that's been a, a blessing in disguise where, you know, it allows anyone who's a successful person building a home or, or even commercial, you know, they, they travel all over. They take a lot mm-hmm. of vacations, you know, it allows them to kind of go to their own website and kind of see the progress of their own their own project. Right. So um, what, what, what your annual sales are how much you said? I forgot. 50, what number? I'm sorry. What are your annual sales all in? Uh. This year we're probably looking at about thirteen mil. Thirteen million. And yeah. what what percentage do you allocate toward marketing? Five percent, two percent of that thirteen million? Ooh, I'd say man, it's probably pretty low. It's probably only like two percent. It could be more, but so you, you a couple hundred thousand anyway, right? Two hundred fifty thousand or so. You, yeah, you try. I mean and then sometimes you know, I look at it as in that sometimes you have to put a model home in some of these communities, which that's marketing and branding right there, you know, carry that cost for a year before you can sell you. So they, they want you to build a quality uh, model home so they can sit in it and and sell off of it for a year or two. Right. Okay. Cool. Commercial is a little bit tricky. I'm, I'm still trying to out a way to get more commercial sales. I mean, you're learning every single day. I mean, once you think you have it all figured out, be ready to fall on your face. Yeah, and commercial is interesting, the whole COVID thing, I'm sure. Um, so, Garrett, yeah. if you had, like, you know, one piece of advice, and say you're talking to, you know, people that are wanting to be like you, build, you know, successful residential companies that do maybe some spec and some uh, custom, 
what would be like your big advice? Say, if you're going to remember any one thing, you met a guy in an airport, he's a builder, and you're about to leave and say, look, dude, if you don't remember one thing, just remember this. What would that be? I would, I mean, I'll reiterate it, team. I mean, whenever I first started doing it, and that's in any business, not even construction, anything you do. I mean, you got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, can you do all this yourself? Do you have the time to do it? And what do you want to get out of your personal life? I mean, do you have a family? I mean, are you married? Do you like to travel? I mean, there's no fun into working your tail off whenever you can't enjoy it, you know? Right. Uh, and also, main thing is work smarter, not harder. I mean, and that, and that we're, we're, we are our own worst enemies. I mean, we like to get in our own way. And you got to have certain people around you you trust, even though you don't want to hear it. You know, bite your bottom lip, listen to them, and just analyze it. You know, the next day, right. like, hey, I thought about it, right? You know, but you got to you got to start with a good team around you. You know, so, you so know how, how do you how do you build a good team? What what's for you? you say you have a great team working for you? How did you build that team? So it starts at the top. So my father and I, once we came to the conclusion of how we're going to work together, uh, now you got the the head of honchos there. You got the foundation there. Then you had to basically branch off. So, I, you know, I went out there and um, on the residential side, uh, we, we basically hired four, no, three key carpenters at the time. And this was in 08 during the recession when it first hit. So people were just looking for jobs left and right. So we basically hired them and just groomed them. We basically, they got sick of working out in the elements. They got sick of, hey, we're busy for two or three months and we're off a month, you know. We basically guarantee them a 40 hour uh, uh, a week paycheck, even if you're pushing a broom. You know, hey, it's like, look, if you're if we're slow, go get a broom, keep the job site clean. Right. So we uh, we groomed them and taught them how to manage in our own way. And that's key. Mm -hmm. You know, you you pick up someone from a different company, they could be sharp, they can make you money, but if it's just term turmoil in your company, it'll kill you from the inside out. Right. So once we did that, we established three good superintendents. Um, and then I uh, went out there and what really helped me was I hired Megan, which she's an interior designer. And I groomed her from a cabinet shop. She did a lot of software and designed a lot of cabinets. I basically designed, uh, created a role for her to be my project manager and interior designer in, within the company. And so all the owners feel comfortable. You know, you have a woman there. She's very strong minded. You know, she's good at what she does. And uh, it just allows her to get the owner, myself, my project, my other project managers, superintendents, and even my father. It's a, it's a good buffer for all of us. It really works well, you know. Right. And sometimes, you know, when you go out to a subdivision, you got well, here you have a bunch of guys in construction thinking, oh, I like that lot. Well, you have a woman's perspective in it saying, no, how about this? And this is why I don't like it. Wow. I never even thought about that, you know, because, you know, right. one, I'm not a woman and it's, it's hard. I mean, everyone has their different beliefs on what security, right. stuff like that, backing up against a road. You know, when when the husband's traveling, you know, this is what you want. A gated community, non-gated community, stuff like that. Right. So, Good. Cool. But Okay. Well, that sounds like some really good advice. I hope our listeners appreciate it. Congratulations for, you know, being so successful as you are, because it's not that easy. Um, Thank you. And if you found, just a quickie, what, what is, how has COVID affected your business? I have some of my own opinions, but how has it affected your business? Man, it, it's affected my commercial side quite a bit. I'm not, I'm, residential, I mean, if you would ask me in March and April, I, heck, I, it was scary. I didn't know what the heck to expect. I really didn't. And then, you know, with the PPP came out to help out a lot of the small businesses. And we just, we put our head down and grind. I mean, we were blessed to be able to be essential. So, you know, we made work sites comfortable, um, safe, and just kept moving our product through. And then whenever people um, started opening back up and started going out and looking at, we had enough inventory out there. Now, commercial, on the other hand, that, that was tough. I mean, it's, it's starting to pick up just now in fourth quarter where we had a lot of volume 
um, started in first quarter, ready to start. And we basically had probably 30, no, uh, three to $4 million of sales that just got tabled, you know? Uh, but you know, it, it just takes time. I think a lot more people are feeling comfortable. We do a lot of, uh, exercise uh, gyms like, uh, yoga sixes, club Pilates where they weren't able to open up their business because of health codes and stuff like that. So we basically had to sit there and wait for, depending on where they were mm -hmm. uh, positioned, you know, what county are you in? What city are you in? Stuff like what right. state are you in? Because Kansas City is right on Missouri and Kansas side. Right. So, um, you know, it, it, it didn't really hurt us that bad, but it made us stronger, uh, if that makes any sense. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, really uh, strategize and, you know, open their ears to other people. How are you doing? You know, a lot of people were like, open to sit down and and talk or before you're like i'm too busy i can't talk to you right, right now you right. Know, get but it was a scary moment and i think we're still trying to get through it right now yeah. so cool well thank yourself, you yourself oh it's been it, it, it? it's been a huge boom for our business actually it because as a friend of mine put it people are feathering their desks or buying a new one and interest rates are really low so in general yeah. our business has never been hotter because people are taking all their disposable income and throwing it and building homes, which has been awesome. Yeah. You're not going to drop. And another thing that I'm kind of questioning right now is like commercial, the office spaces. I mean, yeah. with Zoom, as we're communicating now, I mean, do you yeah. really need an office? I mean, that's something we're really going to see in the next 12 to 24 months where yeah, people are rethinking that because they, they, yeah. they all left their office and nothing really changed. They went, wow, do I really need that yeah. overhead? Because things exactly. seem to work. Everybody's at home. Work, yeah. Right? So it's yep. been interesting. Cool. So, so Ed, you have any final comments? No, I think we pretty much covered it. So thank you very much, Garrett. It's been a been a great episode, and I think you had a lot of really great wisdom and perspective to share with our listeners. And uh, it's great to see that you're you're doing so well, and I think an inspiration to uh, to other contractors out there that are working in family businesses for you to be able to show how you and your dad were successfully able to manage that transition. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you for everything. And just keep grinding out there. That's all yeah, you can do. It's all good. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Thanks all right. Well, thanks to all our listeners. And stay tuned for our next episode of the Contractor Success Tips.